Good morning and welcome to Traveler's Rest United Methodist Church. My name is Christine Matthews and I'm one of the pastors here and I'm so glad that you're worshiping with us today. We will begin with a silent invocation and as many of you know an invocation is like an opening prayer when we are requesting God to meet us here in worship and calling ourselves to be fully present during this time of worship. Let us pray. O oh God, draw close to us as we draw closer to you. Help us to be fully present and aware during this service of worship that we would better know your grace. It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Good morning, and again, welcome to worship here at Traveler's Rest United Methodist Church. My name is Jonathan Tompkins, another of your pastors, and we are so grateful that you are worshiping with us from wherever you are today. Please allow me to lift up just a few announcements for you. First, today is Free Books Sunday. We are cleaning out our church's library, and we are offering the books in it to you. And so today, anytime between 12 p.m. and 5 p.m., you are invited uh, to come here and add to your library by going through our library. Uh, our library is located on the top floor of the Education Building. I want to also remind you that this coming Tuesday, our sanctuary is open for prayer, 9 a.m. to, to 6 p.m. Also want to remind you that beginning next Sunday, every Sunday in October, we are going to be worshiping in person outdoors. We've had a couple of great outdoor worship services so far, and we're excited about this coming Sunday, uh, starting off the October outdoor worship season. That's going to be at 10 a.m. It's going to be in our parking lot. You can worship from your car drive-in style, or you can bring a lawn chair and a mask and sit outside and worship along with us. Each of these services are going to be a shortened version of a worship service, so plan on about 30 to 35 minutes 
each Sunday, and each of these services is going to offer communion. So we're excited about that. So you can bring your own bread and juice, or we will have the little communion to go packets available for you as well. Be looking this week for a video from me with more information about October Outdoor Worship and our upcoming sermon series called Digital Disciples. We're excited about it. We continue with our worship now with the reading of God's holy word. Today we are concluding our sermon series based on the book of Acts, and so I invite you, if you do have a Bible with you at home, you can turn to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. It's also here on the screen for you. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. May God add a blessing to this, the reading, hearing, and living of God's holy word. Amen. Amen. Good morning to you all, and especially to all you parents who have K through fifth grade children. I'd like to suggest that you gather them together and give each one of them a hug and whisper in their ear, the earth is full of the goodness and the love of the Lord. That's from Psalm 33, verse 5. Did you get their attention? How does God get our attention? In today's Bible reading, God certainly got Saul's attention. But I'm thinking of less dramatic ways of how God gets our attention through the beautiful or weird or strange things that we might see in nature. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. How children love to be outside finding things like beetles, caterpillars, stones, leaves, frogs, you name it or maybe listening for bird calls or animal sounds. Perhaps we can point out to them that this is one of the ways God gets our attention. What marvelous things he created. We must respect them and be thankful. The hymn, All Things Bright and Beautiful, comes to my mind. The last verse says, He gave us eyes to see them and lips that we might tell. How great is God Almighty, who has made all things well. Let us pray. Loving Father, thank you for getting our attention to all you have created. And thank you for your love. Amen.
Today we conclude our series, Remember the Church. We have been exploring the first half of the book of Acts, in which the apostles, or the early disciples of Jesus, are bringing in new and different disciples in new and different ways. This brings up several questions for us, like, can we bring in new and different disciples in new and different ways? And also, each week, the sermon title has been a question for us. What should we do? What do we do? What are we praying for? How can we serve? What's to prevent me? And today's question is Jesus saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Today's scripture from Acts chapter 9 is one of the more well-known passages from the book of Acts. Most of us know the story of Pentecost, of the Holy Spirit coming in Acts chapter 2. And then I think a lot of us mentally skip to Acts chapter 9 with the story of Saul's conversion. It's kind of the next big action scene in the book of Acts. Years ago, at a previous appointment, I preached a sermon on the same passage from Acts chapter 9, entitled it, Boom! Radical Life Change. Because Saul was an enemy of Christ. We met Saul at the end of chapter 7, beginning of chapter 8 in the book of Acts, in which he is present and approving of Stephen's stoning. Now, in Acts chapter 9, Saul is on the move. He is actively searching for followers of Jesus so he can take them as prisoners back to Jerusalem. He is on his way to Damascus, breathing murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. So certainly from the disciples' point of view, Saul is the bad guy in this situation. But from another perspective, Saul was a model citizen. He was a Pharisee, a religious man and leader. He was on the fast track. He was going places. He was following the law to a T. He was zealous for the law. And then one day, he's walking down the road to Damascus. It kind of reminds me of a Willie Nelson song, On the Road Again. Because it seems like so much happens on the road in the Bible. The road to Emmaus, last week the desert road, the road to Gaza, and then this week the road to Damascus. Saul was walking down the road to Damascus when, boom, out of nowhere, he sees a light and hears the voice of Jesus calling out to him, Why do you persecute me? Initially, Saul doesn't recognize Who's speaking? So he asks, who are you? And Jesus tells him who he is and gives him instructions what he needs to do. And so Saul follows those instructions and goes to see Ananias, who restores his sight because Jesus told him to do so. And the scales fall off Saul's eyes and he could see again and he was baptized Later in chapter 9, Saul starts to preach in the synagogues in Damascus, and he was preaching that Jesus was the Son of God. You see, Saul's life was changed in an instant. He changed. And Saul wasn't even looking to be changed. Remember, he was a respected religious leader in his community with a stellar record of following the law. And yet he encounters Jesus and his life does a 180. The very man that was persecuting Christians now was a Christian himself and soon to be a great leader in the early church. Saul was changed into Paul. Some of you might be saying, well, that's great for Saul, but that's not really the way it was for me. Maybe you can't pinpoint an exact time and date where you were saved 
or accepted the gift of salvation. And that's okay, because God works in more than one way. Not all of us have a story where we were once leading this horrible life and then all of a sudden changed in a moment. There's nothing wrong with those of us that were raised in the faith and never really rebelled against it. Like I said, God can work in more than one way. In this story, this story is about Saul's conversion to Christianity, but it's more than just that. Because it's not only about not believing and then believing. It's about Jesus totally changing his heart, his mind, his life. For us, that means if we already believe, we still have some changing to do. Even if you have been a Christian all of your life, you're not sinless. You still need to be changed by God. Jesus says to all of us, why do you persecute me? Because our sins still persecute Jesus. And when we sin against other people, we are sinning against Jesus and persecuting Jesus. Now, maybe you have believed in Jesus for decades, but you still have a problem with gossip. Or maybe you have known for years and years that Jesus has forgiven your sins, but you still judge people based on outward appearances. Or maybe you come to church every Sunday and tithe, but you still have difficulty helping the poor or welcoming the stranger. Hear this good news. God isn't finished with us yet. We all still need Jesus to go boom and reveal himself to us in ways that change us to the core. For Saul, there was not only a change in what he believed, but there was a change in how he was living. He was no longer tracking down Jesus followers to imprison them. He stopped doing that and became one of them. His life changed direction. We, like Saul, may be God-fearing religious folk who still need Jesus, who still need Jesus to intervene in our lives in such a radical way that we are forever changed by it. Now, maybe that's already happened in your life, and maybe it needs to happen again. Saul went from actively persecuting people that followed Jesus to following Jesus himself and preaching the good news. That is some radical life change. That is what it's all about. God can change your life even when you don't realize that it needs changing. As you can imagine, with Saul's radical change, no one really knew what to think about this. Ananias, the disciples in Damascus, and later the disciples in Jerusalem are a bit skeptical at first, with good reason. This is the guy who was trying to kill people of the way, Jesus' followers, and now he is preaching that Jesus is the Son of God? Why, yes, he is. Yes, he is. Jesus asked him, why do you persecute me? And Saul persecuted followers of Jesus, so that was persecuting Jesus. Saul never even answers Jesus' question in the scripture passage. And now Saul has been welcomed into the family of Christ. Saul's story reminds us that even though we humans are always trying to limit who gets God's grace, God doesn't work that way. There is no one outside of or beyond God's grace. Not even Saul. Not even the worst person you can think of in history. Not people with the opposite political opinion as you. 
Not even you, not even me. No one is outside of or beyond God's grace. Amen? Now that can make us pretty uncomfortable because we too might be skeptical with good reason. And yet here we are, following a God of radical grace. And new and different kinds of people are being brought into the church, even people like Saul, even people like the Gentiles and the Samaritans, even people like John Newton. Is that name familiar to you? Saul's story always reminds me of John Newton's story. John Newton was born in 1725 in England. He was a seaman, a sailor, and he was involved in the slave trade. Not just involved, but master of a slave ship. He looked at slavery as a business. From 1748 to 1754, Newton had several conversion experiences when he cried to God for mercy during storms on the ship and also when he was very ill. And Newton describes these experiences as turning points in his life and in his faith. But then it took him several years to truly allow God to change his life. And John Newton's story is also about radical life change. But not in a moment. It took years. In 1964, Newton became an Anglican priest. And by this time, he deeply regretted his time in the slave trade. He became an abolitionist and spent the rest of his life working towards ending the slave trade in England that he had once been a part of. During this time, he wrote the words to the hymn, Amazing Grace. It's the story of Jesus saving a lost wretch. And John Newton is talking about himself here. He is the lost wretch. Jesus asked him a similar question to why are you persecuting me? And gradually his life did a complete 180 also. He went from persecuting the slaves to advocating on their behalf. He was convicted, he repented, he changed, or rather God's grace changed him. And so Jesus says to all of us, why are you persecuting me? And there is no one outside of or beyond the grace of God. And it just might be that we are being stretched to extend God's grace to people who we might not even like, to people who scare us, or to people who think differently. And yet Jesus extends God's grace to the likes of Saul. And if Jesus does that, then aren't we as Jesus' followers to stretch and extend God's grace as well. Hear the good news, church. God is still in the business of changing lives. In our own power, we cannot change, but God's grace changes lives. Mine, yours, and new and different people. Amen. For our prayer today, I would like to lead us in beautiful words from Thomas Merton. In fact, if you go to our trail guide, which is on in, in our bulletin, which is on our website, trmethodist.net, you will see that this is also the prayer for the week. And so I invite you to make this your prayer as well. Let us pray together. My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you, 
does in fact please you. And I hope that I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, Lord, I will trust you always. Though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. We make this our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
And now, if you will join me for our sending forth using the words from the song we've been singing during this entire sermon series, We Are the Church. You can sing it along with me. I am the church. You are the church. We are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world. Yes, we're the church together. Amen and amen. <laughs>